one and all, welcome to Seen Through Glass. Welcome back to SF Cote d'Azur, the Ferrari dealership in Cannes. You may have seen that recently I came down here with Paul Wallace from Supercars London and Tony from Gravel Car Sales to try and force Tony into buying a Roma. Long story short, he drove it, he loved it, and we're now following through with that forcing of him buying one. But when I walked into this dealership, whilst there are many cars here that caught my eye, there was one in particular that caught my eye lurking in the corner, and it was this. A beautiful Ferrari 456 in green. Now, I have been intrigued by this car for such a long time because it represents the cheapest V12 Ferrari you can buy. And you guys know me, I like a cheap modern classic, but I also like a V12, because who knows how much longer they're going to be drivable or ownable because the world is an ever-changing place and I think, well, you know, there's going to be a lot of pressure that takes us away from V12s. So, how about the thought of getting into or living with a cheap V12 Ferrari? How bad can it be? Really? Surely not that bad? Let's discuss more. Now, in my opinion, the 456 has one of the most beautiful lines of any Ferrari ever made. It is simplistic, it is stylistic, it's got that Pininfarina elegance, but somehow just, oh, I don't know, it really works for me. And actually, you can see this kind of design has carried through two things like the Roma, the 575, even, dare I say it, an 812 Superfast, who knows? Um, but yeah, this car in green, I need to find out, I think it's the... British racing green, but I've got to check the exact code. It could be Verde Zeltweg to get really nerdy, but let's skip past that. Uh, obviously, pop-up headlights. The last Ferrari made with pop-up headlights. A very cool factor. Um, the wheels, I will admit, do look pretty dinky these days. I think they're like 15 inch, which does look quite small, but this is a comfortable, luxurious GT car, which is a 2 plus 2. You can have passengers in your Ferrari. How cool would that be? Hey, come in my cheap Ferrari and bring your mates with you. Absolutely epic. Now, this this being a 456 GT means it is a manual. So life just gets better. Every time I show you something with this car, you're going to go, wow, Sam, what a car. You should buy it. And I kind of agree. Um, but yeah, so many different things to point out here. Now, this I just need to say this car hasn't been fully prepped yet. It is going to be for sale, or it is for sale here uh, at the uh, SF Cote d'Azur dealership. But there are a few things that they would want to do um, or could do with the car. So you'll notice a few bits of road rash. But that's because the car is, well, 1996, I think the 456 came out. So so, you know, we're cracking on with age now, um, but it's just still the fact that there's no tinted glass, that pure clear glass, then the design around the back, the sort of soft rear tail lights, the exhaust. Now, these V12s from this era sound very different to a modern day Ferrari V12. You don't get that kind of high pitched singing or screaming, it's a bit more of a sort of softer rumble. And that we're going to find out because, with huge thanks to the team down here, uh, I'm going to be taking this for a quick test drive, which, you know, it sounds expensive. I think magnitude five finance stay on standby um, because yes I do think I might get a little bit carried away here <laughs> I tell you what, I am immediately transported to a different era of Ferrari. Found out that this car is a 1994 456 GT, so that makes it nearly 10 years older than my 360, and dare I say, it feels it. I, I mean, you could almost think you're in a 70s Ferrari, but I'm gonna say that is a good thing. It feels like this kind of wonderfully romantic era of Ferrari, but we do have some mod cons. 94, things were happening. There's a CD player. Oh, it's not a CD player, because they wouldn't have had CDs then, would they? But anyway, <laughs> it's, a, it's a player of music. Um, there's fans and air cons and electric switches for things. So yeah, whilst the design and the layout is classic, let's say, there's definitely things that let you know that you know it's not gonna be a complete uh, analog experience. So let's find the seatbelt here. Uh, also confirmation that this is British Racing Green. Uh, and in the sun, my God, does it pop. In the showroom, it looked very dark. The minute this car pulled outside, I was like, <gasps> it's so green, um, which is another main reason that I wanted to drive this thing. I have actually driven a manual 456 before in, oh, now I'm going to really struggle to remember where, Latvia. I drove one in Latvia and it was a vibe. Um, but anyway, here we go again. So, key into ignition. Oh, that manual gated shifter is lovely. Just gonna mess around my fans here, figure out what I'm doing. Beautiful cold air coming out of those air convents. Didn't know that was gonna be a thing. Even my car sometimes struggles in that department. And fires into life. 
Now, as I said, these V12s of this era of V12 Ferrari, very different to what you consider an F12, an A12, even a 599. They're very high pitched, they kind of sing. These are a smoother, almost like a Rolls Royce V12. I'm now looking for the fly off handbrake, which is there, that's down. Engage first gear, relatively heavy clutch, but uh, and away we go. Now, when this car came out, it was the most powerful Ferrari road car ever made. <laughs> However, 0 to 60 times again haven't really lived up to modern day comparisons, uh, where it's sort of four, no, no, five and a half seconds. But as I mentioned in the showroom, this is about comfortable cruising, it's about elegance. And actually, being here in Cannes, being in the south of France, it's kind of the perfect place to show off its attributes. I would have almost liked to have driven this down from London. It's immediately very comfortable. And there's loads of light, you get this huge windscreen, these big old windows. And all of this for, well, cheaper than almost any other V12 Ferrari. The closest car to this is a 612 Scalietti, which actually was its successor. So this car came before the 612 Scalietti, and then it sort of gets a bit sort of weird, doesn't it? Because we had the FF and the Lusso and things like that, but did they succeed a 612? Or would you say that this was kind of a predecessor to the Roma? Oh, who knows? Ferrari confusing us all with the amount of cars they're making these days, but it is still super nice and lovely to be in here. And it's all so supple. It's immediately supple. I miss that from this era of cars. Nowadays, everything's just a little bit too honed in and firm. It's right for a modern car, but something about this era, which I just adore. And then, yes, the manual. <gasps> the potential of this car. The potential of a cheap V12. Ch I mean, I say cheap. Right? It's, not, it's not necessarily cheap, but it's the cheapest V12 Ferrari you can buy. Anyway, gonna uh, zoom ourselves out of Cannes, find some slightly more picturesque roads and some slightly twistier roads, and uh, yeah, talk about this car and the potential of it a little bit more. I have to say, I am immediately surprised by the response of this thing. <laughs> Honestly, was like, oh, it's gonna feel pretty ploddy, but it actually does get up and go. The initial torque, when you put your right foot down, it's there. And reminder, 1994 and 350 odd horsepower, something like that. Like it's, it's not a lot, but that's the V12 helping just push you along the road. It's, I'm starting to get really carried away. Also, because every time I look out over the bonnet, it's green, and you know my issue or my obsession with it. I would be very interested by what magnitude finance would work out on a car like this because God knows what the residuals on a 456 would be. Um, but it is just a lovely place to be in here. So yeah, price-wise we're talking sort of circa 50 for a decent car with probably quite high mileage. Once you start coming to a main Ferrari dealer like uh, SF Côte d'Azur uh, and you're looking at sort of well-maintained cars, of course you're going to start pushing up towards 60 or 70 grand. But uh, 612 Scalietti's in the UK, probably 10, 15, 20 grand over that. Uh, and then 599's another 20 or 30, getting very close to the 100 grand mark. So it's the cheapest V12 by about 20 grand in the UK. However, the one slight thing that needs to be considered is obviously maintenance. <laughs> um, we're of an era of Ferrari where they hadn't quite worked out how to make things super reliable. I mean, you know, they are practical and usable, these cars, but it's all about maintenance and care. One thing that I've really learned with my 360 is it rewards you the better you look after it. The more you use it, the more regularly you service it, the more you stay on top of things, then it gives that back to you and goes, fantastic, thank you, thank you, let's go for a nice drive. This is that weird accent that comes out every now and again when I drive Ferraris, I have to apologize. Um, and so I think with the 456s, because they've been relatively affordable for such a long time, it's meant that some people have skipped on the maintenance, have overlooked getting work done because it can be quite expensive and that was the same with my 360 it took me a long time to find one that was really well looked after well maintained and sort of set me off on the journey in the right direction where if you go right I'm just gonna buy the cheapest 456 I can find you might be in for a bit of a headache and actually when I visited DK engineering recently for an update on my 360 restoration program they had a 456 in their service area that, well, it was in pieces. They were like, every time we looked at one issue, we found another. So I think that's the key, 
is make sure you do your research early and find a car that's been well looked after. You should then, in theory, be able to get away with running one of these cars for a couple of grand a year, maybe? It's always hit and miss with I never want to give that advice. You have to speak to a good independent service to, or, or your local Ferrari dealer to get a real sort of breakdown of what those costs might be. But now I'm here, it all feels so elegant. Um, early today, or if you saw it, a few days ago, when we did that video with Tony and the Roma, that car all stands about, you know, the, the Dolce Vita. That's how Ferrari sold it to me during the press drives and how they send the car wide. It's bringing back this kind of, you know, the gentleman racer to the Ferrari world, the elegant cruiser, the stylistic driver. And this car has some of that. It's not about the mid-engine like, whee! Or even, dare I say, the 812 super fast, shouty, slidey everywhere. It's just about heading down to your mansion in the south of France, saying, hello, Petrunia, what do we have for lunch today? And I might go and see my friend Gio in Milan and catch up with him. Everything just feels like it's just nice to do. And all of this leather was Connolly leather, again, similar to the 360. I think that's maybe why I get so carried away. This is my era, right? Mid-90s to late noughties Ferrari, that's just my jam. And also, Schumacher had one of these. And you know I'm a sucker for anything Schumacher did. Oh, it's such a weirdly tempting thing. I know a lot of people overlook the 456 and might think I'm mad. And Tony and Paul have left. I literally said, cool, I'm going to film that 456 now. And they left. That's how uninterested they are. But to me, it just represents this real steal, this real bargain to get into a great era with a slightly weird but V12 engine all this kind of historic Ferrari feels and vibes and Pininfarina and ah, oh, it's beautiful. I'm starting to get very carried away by this car. Seeing it there underneath the trees, it's just, oh, lovely. But I can't really jump into a V12 Ferrari without revving it out a bit. And whilst I have, you know, thrown it around some corners and had some fun, this thing does rev to just over 7,000 RPM and it does get up and go, as I mentioned. So yes, rejoining the dual carriageway now. And as soon as we get on safely, Let's, uh, let's see what this car is all about once you start to, to wind it out. You start to hear it sing, I was going for a shift, but no, that's only 4,000, 4,500, it still wants to just keep going. Again, I'm shifting a little bit early just to kind of almost manage my speed more than anything else. I know I mentioned this car is not fast in sort of modern day comparisons on paper, but I'm telling you right here, right now, it does feel fast. It's kind of odd that there's not a lot of sound. You're actually getting a lot more sound from kind of the front, maybe the actual engine in the gearbox rather than the exhaust out the back. It's not that loud out back. But here we go again, drop down a gear. <laughs> it's, it's quick. Uh, it's quick enough, but it's, it's quick. Full stop. And then again, it's still just so supple on that suspension. Like, oh, guys, it's a lot going on here. I honestly didn't think it would feel this fast, but it's one of those cars that builds and builds its speed. It's not, let's spin up the rear wheels and this is all a bit manic. It just continues to build pace in that lovely, I'm gonna say that word one more time, elegant way. It's just bloody marvelous. 